Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now for solutions to what ails us. So time now to turn to Dr. Bob Gill and Lucy Reynolds to talk about the National Health Service. Across the world, government, citizens, and economies are facing ever-rising costs of health care. Today we're going to talk solutions to the health care cost and provision crisis here in the UK. Welcome and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Bob and Lucy, uh, at the recent general election in the UK, all parties, even UKIP, promised to preserve the NHS free at the point of use. Presumably they made this promise because the population does not want a US-style system, which is where things seem to be heading. Uh, are, are they keeping their promise? Well, I'm afraid a lot of it, Max, was political spin. I think the politicians are bending over backwards to keep the lid on what they all intend to do, which is to take us to the US model. And we had this Dutch auction in terms of who's going to be um, spending more on doctors and nurses, but in fact the truth is we are copying the US model and the new leader of the NHS has been brought in, especially uh, after his 10 years experience with United Health, he's come to finish off the job. Well, it seems like in the US actually, well, under so-called Obamacare, they're moving more toward, you know, a, a European model, the way it was pe people think of a European model. So it, the, the model that they're chasing the, is no longer even being used in the U.S. Well, I think largely the U.S. model is controlled by what's called supplier-induced or provider-induced demand. So you've got companies who will make more profit by um, subjecting patients to more and more investigations and more and more uh, unnecessary treatments and that's not been a problem of the NHS uh, single-payer system. Even with Obamacare, my understanding is the health insurance industry took over Obamacare and pulled it away from its original intention and diluted its impact. So although the talk is of about um, coming over to a European system, in fact the problem still at its core is to be run by health insurance in companies and also large um, health provider companies, and these are all multinational concerns. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned United Health, and uh, I've had experience with them in the past few years as my mother was ill and had to deal with them. But uh, my family also comes from outside of Hartford, Connecticut, which is the ins health insurance capital of the world. And these guys have 20, 30 million dollar homes. These guys are making a lot of money. In the UK, we're, t we, we're told all the time that there's a funding crisis there. Is the funding because of costly health care issues, or is it because of the rise of these well-paid administrator class since Thatcher? I believe there is a huge a growth in that class. Or is it because of the private finance initiatives, uh, which added huge layers of interest costs to the building of all these beautiful new hospitals all over the place? Well, um, it's, it's all of those things. but. Fundamentally, it's something deeper. There has been, or is ongoing, a repurposing of the NHS. Um, David Cameron was caught on camera once explaining this, and he said, what I want to know from my Secretary of State for Health is how to drive the NHS to be a fantastic business. So if you do uh, an international comparison, I, I work in the health policy arena. Um, my doctorate's in, in um, public health financing. If you look at, at a comparison of uh, developed countries, say within the OECD, and you can make a plot of their, their survival rates, both for the whole population and for infants, which are particularly sensitive to the effects of healthcare, versus the cost of the system. What you can see is the more you stay with a publicly provided, publicly financed non-profit model, the better the results you get, and the lower you lower the costs. So, and as you move towards the US model, which is a heavy outlier, with by far the highest cost, two to three times the cost of, of you know its rivals, its peer group of company countries, but with health outcomes which are on par with the the, the higher end of the third world, actually, um, you can see that it's the privatisation process which is causing the problem. So, the more expensive the system gets, the less well it but tends to work because it's a repurposing. But that's the ironic thing here is that the government keeps on telling. I, I see it all the time in all the headlines of the newspapers here that there's a budget crisis in that NHS. 
therefore we have to get a three times more expensive system. <laughs> That's so it. what is the solution, however? What the ordinary person doesn't want to spend three times as much. They don't want to be turned away at the emergency room because they don't have an insurance card. They don't want, you know, they, they don't want um, complicated paperwork every time they get sick, or especially something like cancer or long-term illness. What's the solution to the ordinary person out there who is, is just sitting there helplessly reading the newspapers as all this crisis and stuff is happening? Well, um, I mean, we need to divide the, the, the system really in the, into the interests of the ordinary person versus the interests of the people who are in charge of things. Certainly in the interests of the ordinary person are for us to pay something in a cost-effective way. We need a, a value-for-money system. We need something controllable and reliable, which lines up the incentives for medical people with preserving their health and improving the health of their patients, not with making money in order to make bonuses yes, for their chief we, executives. We, we, we know that, but what's the solution to it? Doctors don't want a the U.S. Solution. style system. The, the patients don't want a U.S. style system, and yet it seems like that's the well, you can you can see that the dynamic of this in that that lovely little phrase, free at the point of use, which we've been encouraged to believe means free. a publicly owned, publicly funded healthcare system, but it's also completely compatible with private health insurance free at the point of use. Yes. So you can actually see that what those parties are committed to is the same transition which actually the American health industry has been trying to push on us for many years. I've got a document here going back to 1968 after the NHS. And that is the plan by one of Mrs Thatcher's policy gurus, Arthur Seldon. Um, to get rid of the NHS in favour of a US-style system. And he pops up again as one of, of Thatcher's policy people, and then he pops up as one of New Labour's policy people, and guess what? His plan, put out in 1968, is nearing its completion, and we have an insurance man in charge of the NHS. So, unfortunately, it seems to me that the fundamental problem is that the interests of the people who are making the decisions and making things happen have come fundamentally adrift from the rest of the country and uh, in short really that there is there are issues of corruption that we need to be looking at uh, in terms well, of the, that. The, the NHS is roughly 10% uh, of the uh, GDP of Britain mm -hmm. and it is made up of middle class workers, mm -hmm. that nurses, uh, now you could put doctors in the same category really for the most part, uh, the people who run the institutions. Um, Across the board, this government is against all working class people, it's not just people who work at the NHS. It's just there is a, there's a, the biggest group of people who are being affected by the government's policies attacking wage earners and workers happens to affect the NHS the most because it has the single biggest um, workforce. If you look at a, the, the biggest uh, employers in the world, the UK's NHS is in the top 15 mm -hmm. behind the US military, the Chinese military, uh, Walmart, McDonald's, and then not far after that is the UK NHS. But this is not specific to the NHS, Dr. Bob. This is an attack by government against all wage earners in preference to the speculator who is encouraged to go in there and speculate in the housing market, which is, is, is unique to the UK. The UK is the only country that has the, uh, this, this kind of overemphasis on property speculation. So how do you separate the NHS out or, or does it make sense to include the broader picture or mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you fit that in, Dr. Pop? I don't think you can separate it. You're entirely right. There is an attack on the whole workforce of the NHS. Simon Stevens' five-year forward view wants to dumb down the delivery of care, wants people to work round the clock on a conveyor belt system, not dissimilar to McDonald's as you, as you pointed out. Push down the cost of employing people, employ the cheapest possible person you can get to do the job, so you have a race to the bottom in terms of conditions for employment for the staff and also reduced quality in what they can give to the patient. However, that maximizes profit for these executives that Stacey referred to on $30, $40 million a year. So it's about sucking money away from delivery of care, sucking money away from the people who deliver the care up to the corporate um, bodies and up to shareholders and, as you say, speculators. So you, you're having a complete diversion of the intention that people pay tax for to deliver high quality service and high quality health care and money is going, going off to um, hedge funds and uh, other, you know, corporate interests. 
The, the interests of the people who are benefiting by the privatization of the system don't go to the NHS. Mm. They go to private doctors. Yeah. So they don't care. I mean, so, if, if a whole class of people uh, are, are affected, their health is affected, they, they've already demonstrated they're getting rid of firemen. They don't need, there's no fire, get rid of the firemen class. They're getting rid of the teachers. They don't care about teachers. So they don't care. And also I want to bring up the, the private finance initiatives, which I brought up earlier, and say that's the hospital back there, the mayor's office, and you're building that. The, previously, the government built the hospital. And the UK government right now can borrow at its cheapest rate in 350 years. Mm -hmm. Never in 350 years have they been able to borrow so cheaply. Instead, they go to the private sector, which has to pay a whole lot more as a percentage to finance the same project. And of course, what they do is they pay the workers less as they build the thing and, uh, and all the profits go up. But you have the monthly service charges, mm -hmm. or yearly, or whatever it is at the hospital. How much of that is has added to the cost of the NHS? Well, if you take the example of Coventry, um, the people of Coventry were consulted about what they wanted to done about their dilapidated hospitals, and all of our hospitals were dilapidated because capital spending was deliberately held back for decades, so as to set up this situation. They asked for three, 30 million of renovations to their two city centre hospitals. What they got was their two city centre hospitals sold off and an out-of-town hospital at 400 million, for which through PFI they have paid 3.3 billion. So having the wrong solution that suited the PFI guys uh, cost the local people 100 times as much as what they actually wanted. Um, so so is the solution, we have only one minute left. I mean, uh, you know, the frackers, the American frackers want to come in here. Lancashire Council stopped it because the people were out there every single weekend fighting against it. So how do you get people to go out there and fight against this happening to become a US style system? Well, honestly, we need to start with getting some information. We can't get any information because we have a Freedom of Information Act from 2000, and that uh, conserves any information secret that is um, potentially commercially sensitive. So we have a, a petition which we're circulating to get rid of that commercial confidentiality exception so we can at least find out what's being done with our public assets because the signs are that the whole deal is corrupt with PFI, but it's very hard to find anything out. Uh, th that's going to do it. Um... For this episode of Summer Solutions, thank you very much for participating. If you have different solutions out there, uh, put them down in the comments under the YouTube. Stay tuned for the second half. Most people think to stand out in this business, you need to be the first one on top of the story or the person with the loudest voice or the biggest ratings. In truth, to stand out in the news business, you just need to ask the right questions and demand the right answers. Question more. Es absente en el Me tiene en el otro día de la boca falsa. Y yo tiene en el bajo me llevo falso. Era el under Turkish occupation since 1974. If they have, and there you can see some soldiers. Y vale que el tan solo es gente tafosa que se den que ya no está tos. Chico de hanche no te ya tomo. In uh, my village is the road to go in Nathienu village. I think it's a good place to understand how the buffer zone cross around of the city. Some people ask more questions than the government wants them to. How do we make decisions about how we want to vote? How do we make decisions about what kind of government we would like if we don't know what those governments are doing? They are whistleblowers, and they want to know what is really going on. It's extremely dangerous in America right now to be right as a whistleblower when the government is so wrong. So speaking truth to power is now a criminal act. Whistleblowers are growing more dangerous than external threats. And a dozen agents are streaming across my front door. My life at that point 
was com turned completely upside down. They're seen as enemies of their own country. We're at war with a bunch of people who want to hurt the United States of America. And for people to leak that program and for a newspaper to publish it does great harm to the United States of America. What secrets make a government go to war with whistleblowers? Here's what people have been saying about Redacted tonight. Give it to us. Redacted is full on awesome. Really? The only show I go out of my way to watch every week. Exclusive. It really packs a punch. Wow. Lee Camp is the John Oliver of RT America. They do have the same accent. Hey, we are apparently better than boobs. Nothing's better than boobs. You see, people you've never heard of love Redacted tonight. The president of the World Bank, though, hates it. Yeah, but he doesn't have any taste. Seriously, he sent us an email. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to Gregor McDonald for some solutions. Gregor is an oil markets observer, journalist, and data analyst who writes on the challenge of energy transition. Gregor, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Yeah, uh, great to be back and great to see you, Max. Okay, well, I'm here with Stacy Herbert, and we're talking solutions. And Stacy, what are we talking about first? Uh, Gregor McDonald, I have a question for you. You write on the challenge of energy transition, yet there is more oil produced than ever before and more coal. Will the energy tra transition to renewables ever happen? And how will decarbonization actually happen and why? Okay. So, yeah, the, the transition to renewables will happen. In fact, it's already happening. And the place where we have the best visibility on where on where uh, decarbonization was the word that you used, and that's a that's a good word to use. The place where it, we've got a lot of visibility on where that will happen will be in the power grid or in the electricity sector. Uh, last year, just combined wind and solar. That's not including nuclear power or even hydropower. Just combined wind and solar accounted for four percent of global electricity generation. That's actually a pretty big achievement when you consider where we were 10 years ago. So we're going to be able to transition the power sector more easily. Uh, we can talk at some point about the problem of dealing with transportation, which uh, is still a uh, sticky problem that's going to take a long time to solve. So good news, uh, but with some challenges still up ahead. And, and where is this uh, renewable energy happening? Because in the United States, it looks like record amounts of capital has poured into fracking, which of course is even, is, is, it's more than, uh, it's carbonizing an already carbonized system. So there's been record amounts of capital going into fracking. Where is the money, where's the capital coming from for renewables? Is it from China, is it from South America, Europe, where? Right, so the, the global fossil fuel system is still chugging along like it always was, uh, kind of a bulldozer, kind of a juggernaut, cruising along. Uh, we're exploiting more oil, we're exploiting more gas. Uh, the coal sector is in pretty big trouble. Um, but the big, big movers of the last two years in global renewables have been China and Japan. Um, China and Japan, and now with India, if, as long as uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, keeps good uh, on his word, uh, China, Japan, and, and India, and to a lesser extent the United States, are going to drive global solar, okay, global solar uh, build-outs to the year 2020 to pretty extraordinarily high levels. In fact, uh, just using that power grid uh, lens through which to talk about this, I think we're going to go from 4% to 10% of combined wind and solar in global electricity production. And that's also happening here in the United States, uh, Stacy. even though we continue to increase, and you're right, significantly increase natural gas production. Uh, Gregor, um, when we see renewables start to hit the price of oil, the price of oil has been weak, and of course, Saudi Arabia is putting in a lot of supply into the into the mix, uh, apparently to destabilize the U.S. fracking industry a bit. But at, at some okay. point, all the the renewable energy is it going to hit the price of oil? Are we starting to see that yet, or when when will we might see that? 
Okay, so we want to be really optimistic about what the price of renewables can do within the electricity sector, the extent to which they can compete against coal especially, and to a lesser extent natural gas. But we want to be more sober actually, if not a little pessimistic, but at the very least sober about what renewables can do to oil. Oil is deeply embedded in the global transportation system. That's especially true here in the United States, and it's even true in Europe. Even, even Europe, which has absolutely crashed its oil demand over the last 10 years, oil use in Europe is now down to levels where it's going to get very difficult to bring it even lower. So this is like an infrastructure problem, Max. It's like a, and, and whenever you're talking about an infrastructure problem, you're talking about a huge investment problem. How do you displace oil with renewables? Well, you, it's a game of inches. You know, you start moving transportation over to electrical uh, vehicles and natural gas buses, perhaps, and electric buses. I, I see that uh, you in London, actually, uh, the uh, London Transport Agency recently announced a big contract with electric buses. That's nice, but those types of transitions take a long time. And so we're, we're going to be talking about oil as a problem 10 years from now, unfortunately. Uh, uh, let yeah. me just touch on uh, solar for a second. Um, so sure. you, it looks like solar, from what you're saying here, of all the renewable energy sources is becoming the uh, the big winner, I guess you could say. Um, yes. Is the solar technology still reliant on silver, or is the technology moving away to uh, some kind of photoelectric cells that are not using silver? Uh, because a few years ago, the story was that the demand for silver from the solar energy industry was uh, gobbling up lots of supply. Is, is that still the case? Will it grow, or is the technology changing? Yeah, so, you know, I recently went to the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology's big, big uh, solar uh, study presentation in Washington, D.C. Uh, in, in May of this year. And um, there's we've got good visibility on how we can continue to build out the, the uh, uh, this revolution that's occurring in solar using uh, current technologies. But most of the engineers and scientists are very, very concerned about wanting to find other uh, technologies like thin film solar so that we're not as dependent on the kinds of metals and other inputs that you're, you know, that you're referring to. Now, I can't speak specifically to the uh, silver current silver content in, in solar panels, all I can say is that that hasn't been like an input constraint so far. But when you talk about going from 180 gigawatts of solar global capacity in this most recent year of 2014, and, and I've got a forecast that we're going to 600, and some are forecasting 700 gigawatts just by the year 2020. That is going to that is going to create some sort of call on all of the uh, inputs, uh, material inputs to solar. And so I think that's why you've got a lot of engineers at places like MIT thinking, look, we you know just to de-risk this sector, which is growing so fast, we've got to come up with some other uh, technologies like thin film solar, so that we can have some diversification as we as we build this. Out. And Gregor, the United States is an oil empire. They are an empire because they control all the oil lanes. This is why they uh, project power around the world. It's always about securing oil lanes and oil pipelines. Before yeah. that, it was uh, before the American empire, it was the British empire, and they controlled coal. And before that, it was the whaling nations. And, the, and so <laughs> whoever controls okay. the energy seems to become an empire. Yeah. Now, right. is, is this paradigm going to be broken up with uh, this whole range of renewables from wind to solar to electro, hydroelectric? Is that, does that break it up or do, okay. do, Denmark, do nations like Denmark, which controls wind to power right now, uh, do, are they going to become a superpower or China, you say, is investing <laughs> a lot? Or is it just going to um, okay. create a more multipolar world? Okay, I mean, I love that question. That is an absolutely fantastic question. Um, so I, I think there's two there's two plausible pathways in in that question. Uh, just to your point, there is a sense in which renewable energy 
does functionally create a kind of independence. In other words, it reduces that global trade and interdependence, which has been such a big part of our global economy since the Industrial Revolution. And so to the extent that any country, even small ones or large ones, build out tremendous capacity in renewable energy, wind and solar, yes, that costs money to build that infrastructure. But once you've built it, you're basically just collecting wind and collecting sunlight. But there's this other path that's occurring too. To Stacy, and, and it's a very surprising path. And what's happened is that the United States continues to not really grow its consumption of fossil fuels, but it continues to increase its production of fossil fuels. And so one thing that's beginning to happen for the United States, and this is a huge surprise to me, is that the, the U.S. energy balance is actually tipping even more favorably in, in the direction of U.S. power. So somewhere between those two pa pathways, which are competing pathways, the U.S. is, is becoming more powerful in, in the realm of fossil fuel, fuels, while at the same time the world is adopting renewables. And so I think, at, you know, at some point in the future, we can project that oil power probably becomes more diffuse and it becomes harder to define. But the U.S. is going to become a natural gas power in a world that will be adopting renewables at a very fast rate, but also a world that will also be adopting natural gas. So natural gas is something that we may want to talk about a little bit more in the future because we're kind of switching from a world that was an oil world to more of an electricity world and a world that's more dependent on natural gas. All right. Now, speaking of electricity, let's talk batteries, because sure. uh, you've got some advances in the battery technology. Tesla has a right. product. It's a consumer product. People are putting these home batteries or batteries for the home. They're storing energy uh, for a year or two at a fraction of the cost that they were spending on electricity. Okay. It, it, how much of a constraint are batteries or now are we seeing battery, the whole technology batteries open up in ways that'll just yeah. add to the renewable, uh, you know, uh, momentum? Right. So I just did a big five part series uh, on renewables and on this particular issue of storage for a talking points memo here in the United States. And Here's the situation. That, that Tesla battery is sort of like the first consumer uh, storage product that we've seen. And that's, that's great. And that battery is going to store a small amount of energy for the homeowner that could get them through a couple of days. Um, it could also help them uh, purchase electricity when it's at a lower price, uh, say in a non-peak hour, and it could help them use draw upon that energy during peak uh, peak hours when electricity is expensive. But this bigger question, Max, right now as we stand here, we've got to think about building out a, a renewable world with storage, and storage is an expensive part of that infrastructure. And we have not begun to build out that storage. The uh, power grid gurus and the, and the power grid PhDs and, and, and uh, engineers are all talking about this. And the, one of the main messages I get from those folks when I talk to them is we've got to come up with some standards so that when we do begin to throw money at global storage, global storage is built to common standards so that the global network of electricity, and it will become global eventually, can interact with each other across borders and so forth. Well, well, you bring up so a good, that is a very mm -hmm. significant hurdle. You bring up a good point in terms of standards, because right now in the world, it seems like countries are not coordinating with each other. They are That's seeking right. to separate from each other. And yet the, right. the future of something like renewable energy requires coordination around the world. So uh, <laughs> is that going to be a political problem? Yeah, it's almost like we need a United Nations of electricity standards. You know, it, you know, maybe we should, um, instead of uh, gathering all these folks uh, to talk about how to end conflict, maybe we should just gather folks to talk about how to how to uh, make make well, our that, that, electricity Yeah, that was certainly the basis of the Industrial Revolution. What what was standards? Anyway, Gregor, we got to go. But thanks for being on the Kaiser Report Solution Summer. Thank you, guys. Well, that's going to do it for this chapter of Summer Solutions on the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Gregor McDonald. He's a publisher of TerraJewel.us. Tell us what you think about some of the solutions offered here. Offer your own in the comments, should you choose. Bye, y'all.